day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. Dear Crystal Ball, what do you see in our future today? In our future, you see Todd Fisher explaining the beauty of filmmaking through the most famous lenses and equipment ever making movies. Days with Jordan the Lion. It begins right now. So uh, we had talked about in a previous episode, the Cinerama camera, which was the beginning of widescreen immersive film in, in theater. And uh, all of the studios were scrambling quickly to come up with a similar format to keep people in the theaters because people were uh, in droves staying home and watching, you know, Amos and Andy on TV or something, who knows what. And so they st each studio had their own format. So Fox developed CinemaScope, and MGM was working uh, with Taddeo a lot, which Taddeo was the founder of Cinerama. He was one of the original people who developed Cinerama. But then they were like, this is too expensive to have three rolls of film running like this. The camera's super heavy. Uh, you can't change the lens. There's a lot of problems compared to how cameras were used to being operated. So Mike Todd went to... Um, a couple of different people, including American Optical Company. And that's when they started to develop uh, the follow-up camera to that. Now this is the Todd AO Corporation developed by American Optical. So Todd AO, American Optical Corporation. And uh, you can see it was made in Southridge, Massachusetts. Uh, so this, this is a 70 millimeter camera. There was an older camera that had been used on other Productions or early experimentation in large format, but it never really got adopted. But the real holy grail of things is this lens. This is what's called the bug eye lens. And there's a very famous picture of Mike Todd. I think I actually ought to give it to you. You can walk in on it if you want. But there's the picture of Mike Todd reflecting in that lens. And he's smoking his cigar. But he gave $60,000 to American Optical in the 50s to develop a lens that could simulate what the Cinerama camera was able to do with three rolls of film uh, and three lenses. One lens is going to do the whole thing and print it on the 70 millimeter film. And now we don't have to change all the movie theaters because that was the problem with the Cinerama was that you had to retrofit every theater to have three projectors three times over. Not very cost effective at all. Really expensive. Uh, even changing theaters to 70 millimeter would have been resisted by a lot, but it wouldn't have mattered because you could still have down printed this to 35 millimeter. Now you notice over here, uh, stay wide, this is a big poster of Cleopatra. Uh, and you'll notice presented in Todd AL. So that, that starts to become now a selling point, much like today we might say. The sound is Dolby Surround, Dolby Atmos, and people would, that would be a selling point. Uh, 20th Century Fox was saying, presented in CinemaScope. And then, of course, Paramount was saying VistaVision. So here's a camera that was developed uh, by Mitchell Corporation uh, for the Ten Commandments originally, but then later on, a lot of people started using it, and it's a very sought-after format because the film runs through the camera a different way, where you're getting a much larger surface area to expose your image on. In fact, the surface area is the same as this, but you're doing it on 35 millimeter film. So that was a big cost savings, and it's a beautiful picture. Now the movement inside of that camera went on for decades. It was such a good movement that there were companies that manufactured this division cameras much later, all the way into the 90s, and if you come over here, here is the movement. This is the film camera movement. And if you really can see right up in there, can you read that? It says VV1. I got a little flashlight right here. I'm going to put a flashlight on there for you because this is kind of a trip. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do see it. So VV number four, Vista Vision 4. So that movement came out of that camera number four. That movement was taken out and put into a modern camera where you could have digital controls and newer technology. Oh, okay. So that's the same camera. I mean, same movement anyway. Well, the movement is what's... If you watch the way this thing moves, no point intended, movement moves, you see the way this thing pulls the film. Pull, pull, pull. 
and you're exposing the film in this direction. So you're, you see how wide that is? That finder is very wide. So I'm only showing you this so you can see the inside, how it works. But the idea, this, this is format was successful in so many ways. The picture is so beautiful in VistaVision. But Todd A.O., if you have the money, you know, like, so Quentin Tarantino still shoots in 65 millimeter, which in effect is the old Todd A.O. format. So he's using a newer camera, Panavision, uh, as well as Aeroflex manufactured modern 65 millimeter cameras. But the lenses are still very challenging. Um, this lens was designed very much to let you experience the film the way you did in Cinerama, where it was this huge peripheral view. And Mike Todd really loved this format. He was an advocate for not changing lenses and intercutting the hell out of the movie. So every time he talks or they talk, you keep cutting back and forth in the wide shot, all this cut, 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 cut. He didn't like that. A lot of people don't. So instead, a movie like How the West is One that was shot in Cinerama or Around the World in 80 Days that was shot on this would have been choreographed around the camera, all the action. Now, this, in this case, unlike that one, this camera could move. They put this actually on this plate so it could go on a geared head very much like this. Uh, this is a geared head that's made uh, by Whirl, but Fearless made a geared head very much like this that could handle the weight of a big camera. This is a much, this is actually from the same time frame. This camera started being made actually in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. This is a BNC camera. But this camera um, certainly is not going to produce the image quality of the Todd AO. So then you're now you're talking now image quality versus how does the camera move? How, how do we perceive the way these images are being presented to us? So you're inside of this moment that's being recreated and people are talking. So what is the, what is the camera doing? You know, is it moving so much that it distracts you from the scene? Is it choppy, cut, 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 which I think is distracting. So Mike Todd's theory was to say that we were filming with this camera. He would have people step in and out of the scene. So maybe you and I are talking like this here, and maybe I walk out of the scene, somebody else will step into the scene. And then because of the development of these geared heads, maybe the camera would have some motion to it, so it would pick up the next thing. Uh, but too much movement Mike Todd was not a fan of. And you were named after Mike Todd, weren't you? I was named after Mike Todd. I had my Todd Ayo hat on just to pay tribute, homage to him. Now, after this lens, the, the studios were demanding, you know, close-up lenses and other lenses. And then, of course, you were going on to make movies like Patton and Cleopatra. So, like, over here, these are the follow-up lenses. This is a, like, this lens, these were used on Patton. Now, you see there, there's the, there is... There's that geared head over there that I just showed you. That's a Whirl, but it's on a 70 millimeter Mitchell, and it has these lenses, these types of lenses. These are big, wide format, big, heavy lenses uh, that are going to give you the telephoto shot and things like that, and can still cover the wider format film. Still very desirable. Watch the movie Patton. It's freaking beautiful. Watch Cleopatra. It's freaking beautiful. Why is it beautiful? Because the image area on the film is much, much larger. Basically double the surface area, each frame is double the size of a normal 35 image. So you're getting much more information on there. More color, more Contrast, everything. color, everything about it. It's not just about, oh, it's a wide image. Um, these types of, now down here, this lens here uh, was used on Spartacus. Now this is where you're trying to uh, that guess, actual lens? That actual lens was shot, to, did Spartacus. So they're developing, all the studios are trying to develop these wide-angle lenses. This one down here, it's a very weird-looking lens. This lens shot Ben Hur. Once again, that's a 70-millimeter style lens, but look at the strange design on that. Oh, and yeah. Um, that was a, uh, that was literally used for... Uh, they call that an APO Pantar lens. That was used to shoot Ben Hur. All these other lenses here, your cinemascope lenses that were 20th Century Fox's creations, and uh, the they were slightly inferior in the sense that you had to uh, un you had to squeeze and unsqueeze this image. I think I put a projector lens back here. Yeah. So so these lenses have these weird, you know bent lenses on the front and then you had to have a projection lens that would do the opposite. So if you look in there you see how that... Oh yeah. Yeah it's got an egg shape to it almost. Yeah so that has to unsqueeze what you've squeezed. 
So they squeeze it in, they push it on this 35 millimeter film, they squeeze it back out, it allows you to have the big widescreen on a piece of 35 film. That was a cool feature um, and very cost effective because you're still on 35 millimeter, you still get the widescreen. Any movie theater could afford to buy these projection lenses, of which there became many different versions of. But even if you're doing Tadeo uh, and you had 70 millimeters, you still would have needed you know, these, their own projection lenses. So as we move up into the 60s, everybody is um, you know, conscious of the widescreen anamorphic images versus the non-anamorphic. So the movie The Godfather, for an example, was shot on these lenses here, and these lenses are Those literal lenses? Yeah, these actually shot one and two. These were Gordon Willis's lenses. He was the director of photography. These actual lenses were used to film The Godfather. They have, but these are what's called spherical lenses. So it's not a widescreen aspect ratio. If you go in there, you could see Coppola using that camera, which is very much like that camera over there. That's a BNC Mitchell. And then you'll see that these are the lenses that are in play. Uh, they chose these lenses because it had a certain look to it. People wanted, uh, they wanted that particular look for that storytelling. Why did you want the big widescreen image? What was the point of all that? Well, it, there is no point in, in certain cases. Uh, in the case of a musical, you know, all these people dancing on stage, there's a point, right? You want to get all these people on stage. Lawrence of Arabia, you big, vast desert scenes, or Ben-Hur. Ten Chariot Commandments. <laughs> I mean, I could go on. The, the, you know, the epics can justify these, this need for a much wider field of view. But The Godfather is, is a character-driven story, you know, and it's a period piece. It has a certain look, and you don't need widescreen epics when you're inside of the room with Marlon Brown and with Cotton in his cheeks. I mean, you know, it's a different feel. They, they chose to go with the smaller aspect ratio. Also makes the movie less expensive, makes the movie more compatible with theaters all around the country. So th there's a lot of lenses. This, these lenses over here, this, these, these are made by Bosch alone. They're called Super Baltars. But uh, it, like right now at the Academy, I have the earlier versions of those lenses. These are the Baltar lenses made before those. These are called regular Baltar lenses. I have a set of these that used that were used for Citizen Kane, the movie. And once again, standard aspect ratio. So movie Citizen Kane, did you remember if it was widescreen or not? Because I didn't. You know, it, you know, you remember that it's dramatic and it it's it's got all sorts of cool. So James Wong Hao is the director of photography and you know, so I'm loaning those lenses to the Academy right now. They're on display. But this week, these are going to head to the Academy as well. They're doing a thing uh, coming up on Gordon Willis, who is an important guy. But this was an earlier lens, probably from the 30s to the 50s. This is 50s to the 70s. So that's kind of the, the time frame. That lens goes on that camera. In fact, that, there's one of these lenses on that camera right now. And what did this camera film? Well, th th this is a touch of evil... And uh, a bunch of, a couple, some of them filmed my mom did. Uh, you know, it has its own little history. Not quite as famous as some, uh, but that's that's pretty good. Orson Welles. Anything Orson I love Welles. Touchy Evil. Hey, Charlton but, Heston. I mean, wow. The thing about that movie, it actually had one of the most unusual scenes ever. The street scene runs 10 minutes long or something, and it doesn't cut. And it's on a crane, and that big ass camera's on there, and they go all the way into the hotel room, you know, at the end. And that's what's significant about it is that it was an, uh, the idea that you could have a scene run uninterrupted. This gets back to the Mike Todd thing, right? You know, can you choreograph everything around the camera? Does it have to stop? Do we have to do this a little bit at a time? Or can we recreate an entire moment? So in that case, Orson Welles directed this phenomenal scene where the sequence just goes on and everything just happens and it ends up all the way into the interior. So there's, there's some significance to all of those things. His choice, you know, once again, even for that movie, would have been these lenses. You know, he was still going back to the look of Citizen Kane, though. Right? He's thinking, hey, man, that looked pretty good. You know, and, and the, the, what is it, everything looks better in black and white? I mean, or life is more realistic looking. I mean, there's just something about that black and white that, that delivers this dramatic feel to it. So there is something that's being conveyed. This is why back in the 70s when they wanted to colorize black and white movies, everybody freaked the hell out. Uh, my mother, Jimmy Stewart, others were on a 
board to fight that where they were saying you you are this is like changing the lyrics to a song or changing the words in a script i mean you're dramatically changing the feel that was intended by the director the producers and mm -hmm. others i mean dramatically it's the whole feel of it um and their point was yeah but we can market it to a lot of people that wouldn't otherwise watch it i get that okay great but that doesn't give you the right to change it Watch the movie The Fountainhead or read the book Ayn Rand's Fountainhead and you'll understand the story about intellectual property, about rights. Like if I create something that's unique, if I write something, if I film something, it's something I've created and I have a right to maintain the integrity of that product and you do not have the right to change that product. They don't understand this concept in China at all, never will. <laughs> uh, but here, that is how we roll. And, the, and this movie, uh, Gary Cooper and the Fountainhead, it's just awesome. Uh, you know, he uh, plays part of an architect where they change his design, he blows up the whole complex. Because it's, it's, it's that you took my work and you changed it. Therefore, you don't have a right to it. I'm taking it back. That's oh, an awesome story. Uh, it's, a, of course, an unrealistic thing to be doing, but at any rate, <laughs> it, it does drive home the point about intellectual property. Your job is, is to watch it. The guy that directs the movie, Coppola, gets to make the decision. He and Gordon Willis decided what the movie looks like. You don't have a right to alter the way that is going to look. Well, that's not true. You could sit at home and turn your TV any way you <laughs> yeah, want. Exactly. But you're theoretically supposed to watch these things the way they were produced, the way they were created. And a selectioning of lenses is part of that creation. In the early stages of making a film, right at the script stage, the director will sit down with the director of photography and they will discuss the look of the movie. And you'll talk to the set and the props and the whole production design is created around the script. And the director at that point is steering the ship a certain way. So early in the Godfather's planning stages, it was decided to use these types of lenses for a particular type of look. And in addition to that, that sepia that you see, that the tone of the movie, they could have shot that movie in black and white. It would have been fine. But they chose to be somewhere in between. They could have said, let's go for that technicolor look. But is that what you would see? Is it the Wizard of Oz we're talking about or the Godfather? <laughs> so it's kind of cool to see these decisions being made and why they're being made. And there's a lot of choices. Uh, in England, when the United States uh, made, the Bosch Shalom lenses are made by Bosch Shalom. Uh, so these are Super Baltars, but that's a brand name, Bosch Shalom. The lens company that makes my glasses makes these lenses, made these lenses for, for since the 20s. Uh, in England, there's a company called Cook, and they, they made an equivalent of this. Uh, back, and people really love the look of a Cook lens. It has a, a different kind of a feel to it than a Baltar lens. But you see, now here's, here's a Cook lens that would go on that camera, just like the Baltar down there. This has the same kind of mounts, and this lens would, you see how that would compete with that. But it's a different look. So again, the director of photography would sit around and the decisions would be made about what's the look. Now, I, I think these lenses are all usable today because these, unlike lenses that are manufactured today, these lenses were manufactured at a time where you could have uh, radioactive isotopes in the glass. So technically speaking, uh, the, the glass in here, here, I'll show you. Yeah, yeah this is going to look. So inside of that glass, right there. That glass, the way it was manufactured originally, long before it even turned into a lens, had a certain amount of radioactivity to it, much like the way a Coleman lantern has radioactive mantles. It's not enough to kill anybody, but it, it breaks down. So as so like fine wine, <laughs> lenses age. And when they age, you could say, do they get better or do they age in a bad way like people? <laughs> you know, do they get old like people? Does no, it the, fo the focus that affects it or it's, it's, the glass? It's the look. It's um, a little foggy. I wonder if I have a broken lens here. But I keep this lens because even though it's broken, it shows you part of what happens when it breaks down. So if you look over here, you'll see the color. Let's get it's too bright, but yeah, let's just do it over here. Wait. See if we can get the color going. Can you see how yellow, yeah, now you can see it. See how yellow that, your camera wants to correct it. But you see it's almost a yellow effect in that lens. Now your eye sees how yellow yeah. that is, right? Oh, so, big time. So what happened is the lens, I keep this just to show, this is an extreme example, but the lens glass is changing, it's evolving, much the way a Cabernet wine 
would evolve into something better as time goes on. Um, so these lenses, in my opinion, are actually evolving in a better way. And why? Because we live in an analog world, yet we record everything digitally, like the camera, the mics, everything now is digital. The problem is we're analog people. Our ears are analog, our eyes are analog. We like analog. I mean, we're sort of, we, have, we, we are used to this digital world. But in an analog world such as this, the lenses are in effect recording the look of something and people with these newer lenses are too sharp. I mean a guy says to me, you know, I have an 8K lens, I have a, I mean a 4K camera, an 8K camera, a 12K camera. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's like too sharp. You want you don't want to see somebody at that resolution. They do that in sports now. It's like you see well, every freckle. I mean, you know what I mean in sports, okay. Because they have helmets on, whatever. But even whatever it is, you can run a, a. There are certain things where I have no problem with this landscape. You know, there's all sorts of reasons why that. But when you're when you're talking about people, nobody wants to be seen like that. It's unnecessary. In fact, it's non-romantic. Even the old 35 cameras used to use filters like this. I have a huge collection of filters, but this is a filter set that would would have been made for a BNC camera, just like that over there. And in here, we have a diffusion filter which actually softens the image uh, so and let's put it in front of your camera so as you go along it gets more and more and more diffusion and as you get over here it's the heaviest setting of diffusion now the, why is that important because like if you were photographing a woman or a romantic love scene and, and subdued lighting you don't want a razor sharp image you want sort of muted tones impressionistic almost as it were so you can create that effect with, now this is an unusual thing because we have filters, you know, in this case I would have four filters to do this. But this was, I keep this because nobody had this. They literally had it because it literally slid in front of the lens. You could kind of pick what you wanted, which oh, was clever. That is clever. But no one ever did that long, this is not how it's done anymore. But this notion that you can, that you would deliberately soften the image, even if it's 35 millimeter, starts to tell you that nobody wants to see a razor sharp image. So a person is going to look better, and I don't mean when I say sharp. I'm still it's still sharp. It's just not ridiculously sharp, where you're seeing every pock mark, every wrinkle, every hair follicle. Uh, it looks like crap, you know. So we want to create images that are pleasing, and especially when you're doing people stories and you have beautiful people, and you want to make sure they still look beautiful, or even older people, you want them to look as good as they can. So lenses do that. Uh, you can use a sharp, sharp, sharp lens and then ch change it in post-production or you can let the lens just look beautiful on its own right at the get-go and make that decision early. Now, people like Stanley Kubrick were very much lens-oriented. Kubrick had lenses made for his movies depending upon what he wanted to create, an, a feel or a look or a, almost like what we call an effect today. But it's not really an effect because you're creating it on the film and you can't take it away. So Kubrick was working on the movie The Shining and he wanted to create these trippy parallax effects in the hallways when the little girls are pedaling down and the, the twins. And then also Nicholson, when he's starting to lose his mind, he's leaning into the camera. You know, he really looks, the lens distortion helps to enhance the feel that he is losing his mind. So Kubrick had this lens made which is a very wide angle lens, but yet the only lens nearer to this was a Nikon 8mm lens, but it was a full fisheye lens, so it was unusable for realistic filmmaking. But this is a non-fisheye, so it's just super wide. It is a beautiful image that comes out of this, but it's also what you remember about that hallway scene when the pedal, 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 and they turn the corner and the pedal, pedal, pedal. This really exasperated that whole effect. And of course, there's the key to the room. You got <laughs> to have that. Just so. But that movie, of course, everybody remembers sort of the feel of that movie. And, you know, Kubrick would spend time designing the production, and that included choosing lenses or even building lenses. That was built for this movie. So uh, Coppola chose lenses that were slightly older by the technology of the day, but they did it again to create a look. Uh, the, the movies that were being made, like we've talked about, the Taddeo style lenses, the Vis Vision, the, in those days, 
you didn't have a choice. There were no lenses that were like ridiculously sharp. So this was not even a problem. And this, in that day, it was sort of like, how big can we make it? But it's a problem when somebody's head is 60 feet tall, <laughs> you know, you don't want that overly sharp. They're gonna look terrible. So there's the history. You go from the three strip Cinerama process, primarily made almost like travelogue movies. Then you go to Around the World in 80 Days, and then around the same, just slightly thereafter, we're going into VistaVision. Which was Hitchcock. I forgot to show the Hitchcock. Which is Hitchcock and others. I mean, a lot of people used it. It became a, a big Paramount. Paramount was the big adopter of that format. Uh, and then all the CinemaScope lenses, of course, were the, were the lenses that were used uh, for all the musicals that you saw at Fox, including a lot of my mom's, a lot of widescreen uh, epics and things like that. To this day, there are filmmakers that like to use anamorphic lenses, widescreen lenses. But in reality, there's actually not a lot of good reasons to do it because these large sensors can create the same effect uh, with, with, that you couldn't have done in the day. So, but there, there are things about those lenses, the way they refract light and stuff that make them desirable and maybe a choice for a director today. Although it would be a little bit less of a needed thing today because of these huge sensors that the cameras have. But you still put, you retrofit a lot of these so that you could still use them if you, if you well, wanted to. So what we did is, we didn't really retrofit, we rehoused. So it took me yeah. 30 years to find these lenses. So this is the, the original Godfather lenses, but here's the replacement lenses. These are the same lenses rehoused by a company in England where you have that glass put into this housing. And that way I can use this lens more in a contemporary setting. Nice. And this is a company called TLS, and they do an amazing job. So it took a long time to get a match set. We actually would send these lenses to England and have the match. In fact, I have some back here that didn't make the cut. So here's one that I haven't gotten rid of yet, but this is a, an example of a lens. Look, it's perfectly good, but it didn't match the other ones, so it never got retrofitted. But that's an And that would fit on the old... A camera over there, but I've got mounts on these that mount, you know, these mount on contemporary video cameras. So they've been machined to fit on new That's very cool. cameras. So using the old lenses on the new cameras is cool. I did the same thing with a Chaplin lens. I took one of the Chaplin lenses and I put it into a new housing. So there's, I didn't, the people at Panavision did this for me. So inside of there is an old Charlie Chaplin lens. You can see it almost has a yellow tint to it as well. Oh yeah. And this lens, you know, shot a lot of his stuff. Have you filmed anything with it? Have you tried We've it We've done since? camera tests with this, yes. Very yeah. cool. So that's a cool, so I have a series one, series two, series three uh, cook lenses, which basically is 19 teens, like the seven, 1917 up. Uh, so it gets, it, and there, look, I mean, nobody's trying to say a lens from 1917 looks as good as a lens from the 60s, but it does hold up and, it's not like you would look at it and, and right away go, oh, I see the corner is slightly soft. I mean, just wouldn't go there, especially if you're doing a halfway decent job of storytelling. <laughs> I mean, like right now as I'm talking, if you're looking in the upper corners of the frame and saying it's a little out of focus, there's something wrong with what I'm saying. I am boring. You wouldn't be drifting up into the corner of tension there. But I mean, it was like that, though. They did have distortions and little anomalies in them. But I think they're kind of desirable, too, especially if you're making a period movie, right? That's exactly. what makes sense. So, you know, there's the camera I took that off of right there. So there's, that's Chaplin's camera from Estene Studios in Chicago. Uh, and they kind of lured him away from Max Sennett uh, with this technology. And uh, that's still a very functioning camera with the original tripod and everything. It's a, it's a world-class camera. And he made films such as The Tramp and things like that with it. And there's a little picture of him at work with the camera. How excited, I mean, must you be to own all these, especially being somebody that uses them and not just has them on display. You, you can find a use for them occasionally. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna mount, I'm really looking forward to mounting this camera on a 12K video camera. That's something we're gonna do. Uh, we're, we're definitely gonna do it. Cause I, I, and I would, I wanna shoot with this lens and that camera the way Mike Todd intended. So you're gonna go around the world in 80 days? Well, we may not do that, but we'll tell our story, whatever that may be. 
and we'll mount it and kind of tell the story, move the camera the way he would have moved the story, the camera. That's great. Uh, so I do have a, what's called a fearless head that will hold this. This freaking thing is crazy heavy. So there it is. That's why I have all this stuff. Well, it's the sum of it anyway. Thank you so much, Todd. This was a blast. Well, my friends, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this vlog. I want to thank Justine Grant for becoming my newest Patreon. And a big, huge thank you to Todd Fisher for basically breaking down the history of filmmaking, why they use what they use to make things. And we really got to see a lot of history today that uh, I really never thought I would ever get to see. So once again, a phenomenal day in the life of our channel. Thank you all for watching. If you're new here, please hit the like button, please subscribe, and we'll see you all next time. Have a great night. Goodbye.